Hello, and welcome to the Cowgirl Bookworms podcast, a space for those of us who read books and wear boots. I am your host, Brandy Bradley. What's new? What's new this week? What's new at Books and Boots? I got to be a guest on a panel recently because I had led a close reading seminar about Pride and Prejudice at my local library. The theater department at Kennesaw State University reached out to see if I wanted to participate in a talkback session after their production of Kate Hamill's twisty version of Pride and Prejudice. And it was so much fun. It was an amazing production. It was incredibly cool and to see how the audience was connecting with this story. Like, it was very strange for me as someone who has read Pride and Prejudice and seen all the adaptations and experienced it on that level to be in an audience of people who have probably never seen Pride and Prejudice before, who've probably never read Pride and Prejudice before. And so when we get to the ending, everybody in the audience was so invested in the story and it was incredibly cool. Uh, And it was also really awesome for me to be recognized as a literary scholar and to be able to talk about this book that I love with other scholars and the actors from the performance. I hope to have more details about the event on BradyBradley.com, so stay tuned for that. I wanted to make sure everyone saw the photos from the show because the set pieces were absolutely gorgeous. The actors were so great, and they were so funny, and the costumes were perfect. I kept commenting on this one actress's yellow clogs or she was wearing crocs she was wearing these bright yellow crocs with socks and every time that she would have a dramatic moment she would lift her skirt up enough to show off that she was wearing crocs and socks it was very cool and i loved it so all of the costumes were perfect it was an all-around wonderful show so it's in your neighborhood someone is doing a kate hamill adaptation of pride and prejudice it's totally worth it it's a great night out so much fun but i also feel really grateful for the opportunity it actually became one of those serendipitous moments Because I had posted online about my seminar and someone in that department, that theater department, saw my post for my event. And then on the day of the seminar, one of the cast members happened to stop by the library where I was leading the seminar for a completely different task and happened to just dip into what I was doing in my seminar and just wanted to see what it was about because she was literally holding her play copy of Pride and Prejudice when she went in that day. So it was incredibly cool how it all came together. Authors spend so much time trying to position themselves for opportunities, trying to be chosen, begging to be picked. And this was someone who found me. And that was incredibly cool. I love it when those moments happen. I love when someone reaches out and it just all falls into place. It's inc- it's it's incredibly awesome. So I do love that. I've been doing a lot of work and a lot of writing about what it means to be seen as a writer or having to allow yourself to be seen as a writer. So I'm really thrilled that I put myself out there. They saw me put myself out there and they said, hey, let's invite this person to come show us what they're all about. So that was incredibly cool. And I love that. They invited me and it was an awesome time and it was an awesome play. So highly recommend. So what's the story? This week, I wanted to try something different. The piece I'm reading this week is from several years ago. It was a previously published nonfiction piece that I'm really proud of. It's called Good Old Boys Like Me. I learned that my house had been torn down from a text message. A friend I had grown up with had driven to work one morning to see the house empty, but standing only to return that evening to find a vacant lot. The message she'd sent me only said, They tore down the house today. I knew this day was coming. My siblings and I agreed that none of us had any intentions of living in that house. It was not habitable for anyone to live in, and renovating it would cost too much money. 
Before my father died, I collected what mementos I wanted and then signed my rights to the property over to my brother. I told him he could do whatever he wanted to with it. I thought when the house was gone that it might feel like relief. Instead, it feels like I'm mourning another member of the family. The house was old when my mother bought it. She had rescued it from a demolition when the factory in our town planned a major expansion which encroached on several neighborhoods and the old high school. I was maybe five years old. I have a memory of the house being delivered to the property where we had lived in a double-wide trailer, but it is merged with this myth of my mother getting the house for us. When I think of that day, I see my mother behind the wheel of her dark green Ford Bronco pulling the house down the highway on a flatbed trailer. The house never rested well on its foundation. It shook when anyone walked from room to room, only a tremor, but I never grew accustomed to it. The roof leaked, raccoons lived in the attic, and mice in the kitchen. We came home at night to snakes at the door. And now it's all gone, dozed, burned, and buried. A month after my mother died, I received a phone call from my sister. Did you know that Al was living with Daddy? I had not. At that time in my life, I was mother to a kindergartner and married to a man in the process of completing law school in Lexington, Kentucky. The drive home to Bells, Tennessee took more than five hours, and I'd expended all my vacation and sympathy time driving back and forth during my mother's slow death. I had no idea what was happening in the house unless someone called and told me. My sister called the Friday after Thanksgiving in 2010, six months before the newspaper fired me from the advertising department, nine months before I found myself pregnant again, and a year before Daddy died. Funerals and grief convince family members that they are united somehow. However, my siblings and I were as divided as we had ever been. My brother lived a mile down the road from where we grew up, raising two boys with his high school sweetheart. Their home had been submerged during the 2010 Tennessee flood, and they were living out of a trailer on the property he owned. My sister lived one town over, loading up her passport with stamps from other countries as a missionary. I lived the furthest away, which made me the least helpful when it came to our parents. I told my sister I had no knowledge of Al living in the house with our father. Daddy said they stayed up all night playing guitars. I figured he just crashed. No, he's living there. With my sister's Tennessee accent, her no sounded especially prissy. I went over there last night to see him and Al was there. Do you not remember Al? I vaguely remembered Al. He was my father's buddy who roamed. They went to high school together and were in a country band. My mother hated Al. My father and I talked the day before, and he sounded happy. I walked to the edge of the family housing dormitory to make all my Thanksgiving phone calls. Grandparents, nephews, daddy. It had been drizzling, and I hadn't worn a proper coat. I'd wanted to smoke, and the phone calls gave me an excuse to do that away from my child. My daddy was excited, telling me how he and Al jammed out to the Beatles all night long. I can envision these two men sitting in opposite chairs playing Hard Day's Night over and over again until they felt like they'd hit all the chords right, with a whiskey bottle between them, nearby cigarettes burning in ashtrays. My father sounded the happiest he had been since Mama had died the month before. I didn't question it. He is living there, Brandy. My sister was upset. He is standing in our living room holding a Budweiser, wearing our mama's pajama pants, staring at my boobs. I wasn't sure what upset her more. The leering gaze, the redneck beer, or the fact that this man was wearing our mother's faded red pajama pants covered in hearts. Perhaps it was all of it. I was caught off guard by the pajama pants. Daddy said he was washing his clothes because he ain't got none. My sister was fuming. I can't have this man living in my mama's house. She would not want him around. She hated him. What are we going to do? Don Williams sings a song called Good Old Boys Like Me. In the third verse, the song tells the story of two Southern men, childhood friends, whose lives took different paths. One of them decided to live a faster life, 
burning him up on bourbon and speed, while the other was smarter than most and I could choose, learned to talk like the man on the six o'clock news. The one who was smarter than most left home at 18, but never feels like he can leave his home. He sings, I can still hear the soft southern wind in the live oak trees, and those Williams boys, they still mean a lot to me. Hank in Tennessee. I guess we're all going to be what we're going to be. So what do you do with good old boys like me? When I was a kid, my father and I were close, mostly because I didn't bother him. We watched TV. I read. He played guitar. If he was left in charge of me, he'd load me up in the truck and we'd go to my grandfather's barn where all the drunks gathered and ask to hear my father sing. I knew all the songs my daddy knew and can still sing them today. I would sneak off with his cowboy boots and hat. I hung around with the other cowboys and rednecks, and they all laughed when I sang about drinking and waking up with strangers. Eventually, my mama took me to work with her because little girls had no business hanging around with my daddy's friends. When my sister asked, what are we going to do? I didn't have an answer. In fact, I didn't feel like I had a right to answer that. I didn't live within arm's reach of my family, which meant I had no access to assess the situation or the authority to call the shots. The person who made the calls had died, and we were all lost about what our roles were in the family. Our brother was the logical choice for leadership. He was local. Most people in the community deferred to his judgment. But he had his own problems, his own grief over our mother, a family of his own, and a waterlogged house he had built himself. Taking on the added responsibility of running off a man who made sure our father was fed and happy didn't seem like a smart call. I saw Al when we celebrated Christmas that year. All the siblings made a point of being in Tennessee to celebrate the first Christmas after my mother died. Once the family began to realize that Al had no plans of leaving— Folks bought him socks, sweatpants, and t-shirts. Al was there for present exchange as well as Christmas breakfast and dinner. Wherever Daddy was, so was Al. It was awkward. Before I headed back to Lexington, Al caught me by the car and we had a conversation about how he felt he needed to stay and help and take care of my Daddy. He said, I ain't talking about you. I know you got a family far away, but your Daddy needs somebody around. He talked about how my sister never came around and how my brother didn't need any more on his plate. He told me he was clean in the house and wondered if there was any of my mother's things I wanted to take with me. At the time, it didn't occur to me that he might have been looking for things to sell or maybe even prying for information about what was valuable. It was all junk to me. The family business had shut down when my mother died. We weren't worth much. I told him if he was digging around, I had a box stash somewhere of music boxes, which I had collected when I was young. I described one of them to him, which was two children in a boat, and when wound, it rotated and played, You Are the Sunshine of My Life. The little boy and girl looked like they bobbed on water, and the girl held a detachable pink ceramic parasol. None of these music boxes were valuable. Anyone can acquire the same bobbing boat figurine on eBay for $3. The sad reality of old drunks is they can't stop drinking. It's too late. They are already so dependent on alcohol that if they stop, they go into withdrawal symptoms and possibly the DTs. Delirium tremens, DTs, present as confusion, a rapid heartbeat, and a fever. The death rate is only 1-5%, to but that statistic doesn't mean much to me. I would listen to stories about these cowboys and old drunks getting hard up and not having money to drink, and those stories transitioned into recollections about what they saw during the DTs, spiders and monsters, and feelings of being eaten alive. Long before Al moved in, my mother lay in a hospital in a coma. My brother discovered our father sitting in the house having a conversation with an empty chair. He told my brother George Strait was sitting in it. Off to the hospital they went where I was sitting on the ninth floor with our mother, watching her body twitch with seizures while the nurse injected her IV with meds. When my brother arrived, we swapped places. I sat with our father in the emergency room where the nurses hooked him up to an IV banana bag to detox him. 
He wore an old Hanes white tank top, a pair of Wranglers so faded they were almost white. My father's skin, which had always kept a tan, was gray. When the doctor came in and told me, your father can't continue to drink and detox this way. He needs to go to rehab or else the DTs will kill him. Apparently, we were the 1-5%. to There was nothing we could do to convince our father to either go into rehab or to sign over his rights to us. He would do neither. When Al moved in, he kept us from making the rehab decision for a little while. Al kept him in enough booze to keep him from delirium. He took on the role that our mother had occupied, taking care of a man who did not want to take care of himself, but would never admit it. Eventually, Al and Daddy started to get into trouble. They began to act like two teenage boys who had a house full of liquor and no supervision. One day on their way to town, they were pulled over by a cop because they were driving down the road with the passenger door open. My daddy's leg was hanging out of the truck as they took off down one of the back roads. They had buckled him in, though. This was their defense. The cops sent him home. Both my siblings were aggravated with all the questioning I had surrounding the particulars of these events. Was it a sheriff's deputy or a state trooper that pulled them over? Why did they call you? Why weren't they arrested? How drunk were they? What was wrong with Daddy's leg that he couldn't get it in the truck? My brother would eventually yell at me, I don't know. He was not the one who needed interrogation, and I wasn't getting any answers from my father. Each time I called, I asked, Do you want Al there? And he'd say, As long as he wants to stay. They disappeared together one day. My mother's father, my pop, who lived next door, saw them pull away my daddy's diesel truck, which growled down the highway. No one knew where they went. They were gone for two days. We couldn't call the cops because they were two grown men who had left of their own volition. When they came back, they never admitted where they went. They only said that they had gone for a ride. Things which had already been strange got stranger. Those who stopped by the house reported broken furniture and loud noises. Pop thought they might be fighting. My brother thought that they were getting fall down drunk every night. My father's mother put her foot down. She told Al it was time to go. She bought him a Greyhound ticket and drove him to the station. Of course, it didn't take. Told my grandmother that the place he'd planned to stay had fallen through. She called some of her friends at the welfare office and secured a place for Al in a men's shelter in Memphis. Drove him there herself. When I called home, I asked Daddy about Al being gone, and he said he won't be coming back. I don't know what happened between them but he never talked like he missed him. Not long after Al left, I got a text message from my brother, which read, Daddy's in jail. What do I do? Do I pay his bail? I looked at it for 10 minutes, and then I took another 10 to compose the message. We knew that a DUI hold would be for 24 hours if he wasn't bailed out. He was driving to get cigarettes at the gas station up the road, a gas station which had seen him and many other individuals incapacitated. It was a gas station attached to a motel where my friends in high school would rent rooms so they could have sex with their boyfriends without judgment or experiment with drugs beyond weed. The gas station also ran an illegal casino in the back. Their turn-the-other-cheek policy was known. For anyone at that establishment to alert the state troopers to my daddy meant that he had to be in real bad shape. I wish I remember exactly what I'd said to my brother. I realize now that him texting me was perhaps him asking permission to leave our daddy in jail. We could have used the arrest as leverage to get daddy into rehab. We could have made it work to our advantage. But instead, I think I asked... Are you going to regret making him stay in jail? Maybe Al was keeping Daddy alive. Or maybe Daddy knew he didn't have much longer and didn't want his friend to see him like that. Or maybe Al was taking advantage of him. All I know was that after Al left, Daddy started to die. The calls and text messages about jail and rehab and power of attorney changed to in the hospital, ICU, and come get what you want from the house. I had an antique bedroom set which belonged to my great-grandmother that I'd left back home because it wouldn't have survived the multiple moves my husband and I had to make to finish our education. My brother said, if you still want it, you better come get it. 
I was pregnant. A couple of months, but already showing. I recruited my best friend Sloan to make the drive and store the furniture for me at her house in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. I promised her I would have it out of her house in a year or so, but I knew I was lying when I told her that. I stopped by the ICU to see my father, who woke up long enough to recognize me. I told him about my son in Lexington and that I was going to have another baby. He couldn't talk because of the tubes down his nose and down his throat, but he mouthed, I love you. I love you too, Daddy. At the house, Sloan and my brother loaded the furniture into her SUV. I also picked up some other things, which I couldn't bear to let rot or go to the state if they took the house. My brother and I engaged in negotiations about what was most important to each of us. He wanted the guns, which Daddy had taught him to shoot. I wanted the guitars, because Daddy had taught me to play. My sister could not be there for the event. I saw some of the evidence of Daddy and Al's life together. A glass cabinet, which had been full of porcelain gum with the wind figurines, had been smashed, and all the figures inside it had had their little heads ripped off. I wouldn't allow Sloan to come inside, because I'd been told by my brother that Daddy had been sitting in his own shit most days because he couldn't walk to the bathroom, but still refused to offer to help. Sloan knew my family was a mess. I phoned her every day when my mother was in the hospital and texted her every time some news came through about my daddy. But if she'd walked into my family's home and saw the damage, the reality of how my daddy lived, I'd never be able to look her in the face again. While I was inside grabbing things, Sloan stood in the backyard and poked through some junk, which had been thrown out the back door. She showed me what I thought was one of the Gone with the Wind figurines. When I saw it up close, I realized it was the musical figurine of the boat with the two children in it, the one that I had told Al I wanted if he found it, and it was smashed. It was just the boat part without the children or the music box. It looked like someone had thrown it, hurled it onto the back deck, and left the remains to be buried in the leaves and the muck. Sloan found the pieces of the broken children and put them in a Walmart bag. I told her to just leave it where she found it. When we got in the truck to leave, she told me, don't be mad, but I saved those pieces. You might want them someday. I couldn't listen to that Don Williams song for a long time. And even now, I still cry thinking about how much those Williams boys still mean a lot to me. The writer of that song, Bob McDill, did not write that song about my family. However, I grew up in Williams in the state of Tennessee, where packs of men took care of each other who burned out. Because they understand what being burnt out meant. Maybe those burnouts appreciated it because it didn't come with a sermon and a guilt trip. And maybe I claim that song because I too left home at 18 with no plans to return. And what felt for me like an escape from a situation that I could escape from, wanted to escape from, left others to pick up the pieces I'd left behind. So what do you do with good old boys like me? I was standing in a Michael's craft store when Daddy died. My brother had already called and told me it was going to happen that day. The doctors had, again, suggested surgery to be followed up with rehab. My father refused treatment. He chose to let all his organs stop working one by one. My brother stayed with him. I didn't go. For lots of reasons. I could maybe point out that I was pregnant. I could cite the economics of traveling for dying parents. I can blame being a parent, or a wife, or my lack of employment at the time. But I didn't go because I was so mad. And that wasn't fair to my brother. I was standing in line holding a skein of yarn. When my brother called, I shoved the yarn into a candy display and walked out. All I could say to him was, okay. When my husband and I packed up to move away from Lexington, I found those music box pieces still covered in dirt on the top shelf of a closet. My brand new baby boy was napping in the living room and my older son was busy packing up all his Legos. I thought about all the damage left by Daddy and Al. My sister took no mementos of our father. When she finally had gone to the house to see the mess, she was too disturbed by the destruction. In her old bedroom had hung a replica painting of Scarlett O'Hara in a long blue dress. She'd received it as a birthday gift from our mother. Someone had ripped the canvas, even though they fell into it or they took a knife to it. She was so brokenhearted when she found it, she just left. 
On her way out, she stepped over the Gone with the Wind figurines, pieces which had once belonged to her, scattered on the floor, missing their little heads. I can't believe they did all that, falling into stuff. It just looks so angry, just meanness. She blames Al, saying he was spiteful and mean and mooching off our daddy. I told her I couldn't stand to think about it. I pulled the busted music box from the closet and handed it to my husband. This isn't the thing I once loved. And I told him to put it in the dumpster. I want to thank you so much for allowing me to read this to you. Please check out my companion piece in the Company of Liars, which is available at the store on brandybradley.com. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this, remember there's new content on brandybradley.com each week. Also, don't forget each month I'm delivering new exclusive content in the Books and Boots newsletter available at brandybradley.com slash newsletter. Read books, wear boots, XOXO. Yeah.